Wow. That's probably the first, well, definitely the first and probably the last time I'll have had a, uh, a warm-up band. <laughs> so, um, I have to start out with an apology to Ron. I'm not sure where he is, but... Um, so last year I had Lori Garver out in the field with us in, in a snowpack at about 11,000 feet, and uh, Ron's wife had told us, hey, no, nah, we can't make the call. Um, so Lori and I were yapping in a snow pit while Ron was calling from the space station. Five times. <laughs> I'm sorry, Ron. <laughs> very, very sorry. Um, so, so nearly as much as I love my, uh, my science exploration, I also love the stories of how people came to their, to their uh, scientific explorations themselves. And, and when you get down to it, and I think the flavor of today really shows this, that science and technology are all about the people. It's people making it happen, and, and that's where you all come in uh, with the Space University, the International Space University. So, so my path began here as a, uh, as a six-year-old, and it's a little hard to see, but the Matterhorn is, uh, is back there. And uh, I can still, in my mind, I can still see the vibrant white snow against the blue sky. And we walked around the, the mountaineering shops. My dad bought a pair of mountaineering boots, and I can still smell that leather. And that's when it was seated. And I think my mother's expression here really shows that she knew the trouble that this was going to bring, which was the ice climbing, the snow climbing, the rock climbing. But what ultimately this led to was a lifetime of looking at snow and getting to know snow. Uh, what I didn't realize, though, through the first uh, 37 years of looking at snow and being in snow was that I'd always thought that the snow was white, and in fact, the snow is not even that white. Especially when we're faced with the evidence, and uh, this evidence is coming through loud and clear here in the Colorado Rockies. But it wasn't until about the last 10 to 15 years that we've gained the technology that's allowed us to quantitatively understand these impacts on our mountain snowpacks. All right? So the, the field spectrometer, the airborne visible infrared imaging spectrometer, those were brought to us by a particular person, Alex Getz, who once was at JPL and then was at the University of Colorado. And then the spectral radiation and energy balance towers that have pyranometers that were brought, brought to us in the previous century by Angstrom, right? So those relationships are very important. So climate change is upon us, and we live now in what the Nobel laureate Paul Kreutzen termed the Anthropocene. It's a period in which humans have become a force of nature, right? We're a man-made uh, geologic epoch, right? And in this time, we're facing retreating glaciers, down-wasting glaciers, retreating snow cover, extreme weather, heat waves, uh, extreme drought. But not least of which, the impacts of climate change come in its impact on water. Water availability, water, uh, water quality. So if we look at global stress around the globe, at water stress around the globe, what we see is that, if you look closely, you see that it's, it's in the deserts and the mountains where there's the greatest stress. And it turns out that the water there is primarily coming from snowmelt, where we have our greatest stress. And you can see that this, this span of the, the blue hash, this comes from Tim Barnett, the, the blue hashed is the snow-dominated parts of the world, coinciding with those areas. Now, Michael threw up the... Uh, the, uh, the challenge from geeks uh, to make a difference to a billion people's lives uh, within a decade. Well, arguably by the end of this decade, it will be pushing over two billion people that will be affected by changes in the snowpacks around the world. So that then forces us to need to understand what controls snowmelt. Now, there's this popular misconception that Snow melts faster because of increases in temperature. Now, it's true that that's the case, but that's not the primary driver. The primary driver is absorbed solar radiation, right? So the black curve here across five very warm days in Colorado, that's the energy that's available for melting. And you can see the sun come up and, right, it warms up. We get more energy into the snowpack. 
Well, the red trace here that follows it almost identically is the absorbed sunlight. What controls the absorbed sunlight? Well, obviously the sunlight coming in, but also the reflectivity of the surface or the absorption by the surface. And that's the subject of this talk. If it will let me go on. There we go. All right. So, uh, literature is full of this. Tradition is full of this. Uh, and unfortunately, at times, science is full of this, that, si that snow is white, right? But it turns out that snow is not always white. And in fact, even when it looks white, there are little particles in there. There are little black carbon particles, dust particles, pollen, that are just slowly absorbing a little bit of radiation and putting that into the snow and just chipping away at the cold temperatures of the snowpack and gradually priming the snowmelt pump for when the snowpack gets to zero degrees C and it's ready to start melting. And that coincides about the time that the great dust storms start to blow out of the deserts of the world. And we end up with snowpacks that look like this. Now this photo tells the story really almost by itself. A nice clean roller of snow has come off of this face up here and out onto dirty snow. And because it has high reflectivity, it reflects almost all the radiation back. But the dark snow melts out from underneath it. And it was this kind of structure out on a snow surface that made me realize the magnitude of this impact and the loss of water. So in that previous shot, the difference in the reflectivity between those two, or the absorption, right? there's about a doubling of the absorbed sunlight by that snowpack that's much darker. Now, if you wanted to get the same amount of sunlight absorbed by the clean snowpack, then you would have to move that clean snowpack closer to the sun than Venus. Okay, so vegetation wouldn't do very well under that. Humans wouldn't do very well. And, hu and the snowpack doesn't do very well under that kind of scenario. So how long has this been going on? It's been going on always. We've always had black carbon uh, blowing into the, into the mountains from forest fires um, and, uh, and then dust, of course, blowing out of deserts. But... <laughs> In the Anthropocene, we're beginning to realize that there have been considerable changes. So in the Himalaya here, the figure in the upper right is dust concentration. And since the 1850s, there's been a quadrupling of the dust load into the Himalaya. And then since the 1970s, there's been a considerable rise, about a tripling of the black carbon blowing into the Himalaya. So where's this coming from? This is showing the the uh, atmospheric uh, brown cloud, excuse me, of um, the Indo-Gangetic Plain, right? So from Pakistan and India and across down into Bangladesh. Let's see if the movie will run here. Ah, here we go. So, biomass burning has been intensive in these regions. People living on the and of with the Pakistan exploding population there, more of the landscape is being burned, the and earth. these large plumes of From black March carbon April, are blown out into the air. Season, thousands of farmers light fires at the same Brick time. Brick smelters. These fires give off considerable smoke. And the displacement of the old rickshaw, carbon. the bicycle-drawn taxi, with diesel-burning taxis, and the large diesel traffic now uh, that is all over this region. I, Peter mentioned the, the, the cost of fuel there, and yet these are running like crazy all the time. And then back to the dust. This is a shot from uh, blowing, dust blowing into the Himalaya from the Tar Desert on the border between India and Pakistan. It's vast sums of, blo of dust blowing into, into the mountains. Now, we need to understand that deserts inherently are stable. So a long time before, the loose material has blown away and we're left with biological crusts and physical crusts. And so not much dust can blow out of them. But once there's a disturbance, a disturbance from a hoof or from a tire or a tank track, then it breaks through the crust and the loose material underneath is free to blow. And this is where the change has come in the Anthropocene. Now taking it down to ground level, this is looking south from the Himalaya, from Mara Peak off at the atmospheric brown cloud. 
Uh, Kathmandu is down in the muck down in here. And occasionally this sloshes up into the Himalaya, heats the air above the snow cover, and then also deposits into the snow cover and starts that warming and starts the melting process. This is a little further north and looking at the snow surface and you can see how dirty it is right in here. Intensive melting going on. Nearly 2,000 kilometers to the north lies the Tian Shan mountain range on the border between China and Kazakhstan. These mountains lie downwind of the Aral Sea, which itself is an ecological disaster. It's been dried up, and that's revealed huge amounts of sediment that blow and reach their first obstacle, which is the Tian Shan Mountains. And then the Caucasus Mountains between Russia and Georgia. Since the 1930s, these have seen an intense rise in dust deposition, increasing the melt of the snowpack. And even as remote as the Antarctic Peninsula is seeing more than a doubling, actually, of dust since about the 1930s, which coincides with the introduction of sheep to the plains of Patagonia. Right? So the story becomes clear that disturbance is key and pollution is key. So now I'm going to take you to a little closer to home, and this is the American West. And this is a story that has all of the icons of the American West. It has the snow-covered mountains, it has the deserts, it has the cowboys, the Native Americans, the sheep, the cattle, everybody is involved with this, and ultimately the dust and the mighty Colorado River. This is showing a dust storm blowing out of the Four Corners region and into the Colorado Rockies, ultimately resulting in a redly tinged snowpack, one that expresses that intersection, that collision between the deserts and the mountains. And it also expresses intense melting of that mountain snowpack. How long has this been going on? Here we are again, crossing 1850, the vast disturbance of the western US from grazing by cattle and sheep, drew the dust load up to five to seven times greater loading into the snowpack. So now I'm gonna take you into the evidence that I think points to an answer of yes to my title question, can cleaning our darkened snows stem the climate change tide? So this is a little, this will be a little intricate and watch the arrows. Um, so this is, these are data from our energy balance towers that we have in the high mountains in the Colorado, uh, Colorado River Basin. We have very detailed measurements on them as I mentioned before, thanks to Angstrom uh, and others. And from that information, we can tell how much additional radiation is going into the snowpack, how much sunlight is going into the snowpack that wouldn't otherwise be because of that dust and black carbon. The traces that I show over here are time series of snow water equivalent. So just how much water there is in the snowpack if you were to melt it all the way down, okay? And so the red curves, these represent present day dusty conditions, what we observe. And where it goes to zero, this is when we've lost the snow cover. This is when we have complete meltout. All right, so ordinarily I show this with the arrow running from clean snowpack out to the right, which we've modeled using our, uh, our measurements. And I show what the dust has done by moving from clean to dirty, from blue to red. But instead, in the interest of this talk and looking out toward the future, and the spring that's been loaded by this dirty snowpack, I'm gonna look at what we can do in going from the dirty snowpack to the clean snowpack. Now, the number here, 51, this is in 2009. It was an extreme year of dust in the, in the upper Colorado. That's the number of days difference that the dust deposition causes the snowpack to melt out, right? So the dust is causing the snowpack to melt out nearly two months earlier. When we consider this in terms of glaciers around the world, glaciers are isolated from the energy inputs, the sunlight and warmer temperatures, by a snowpack overlying them. But as we remove the snow cover earlier, more energy can go into the glaciers, and that can be melted away earlier. So if we do that year after year after year, that's going to put a power into those glaciers to remove them. Okay? So here's the other thing we want to look at. Now watch this arrow. 
if it goes up. There we go. So presently, when the, when the snowpack is melting out, if we were to clean it up, there would still be 75 to 80% of the snowpack still on the ground. And it would look like this instead of this. Right? So this takes us away from what we're facing with the climate change. Right? Now, it's not going to take care of everything, for sure. But in a regional sense, this can afford us some insurance against it. Right? So these are regional solutions for a regional problem. They would be felt immediately in a regional sense and protecting those water supplies. So in other words, we bring that clean snowpack back to Earth and we get rid of the dirty snowpack. Now this has caught the attention of uh, policymakers, uh, politicians, uh, due to the health issues and the climatic forcings, largely in the sense of what it's doing to atmospheric heating and not so much in terms of the snowpack, although that's becoming realized through these efforts. Uh, the UN had their statement, uh, and then this year, the Department of State put together a, uh, a climate and clean air coalition to reduce short-lived climate pollutants, and black carbon is one of those, one of the most important of those. And then there are research groups uh, such as that of um, my colleague Ram Ramanathan uh, at Scripps, along with his daughter Nitya, who have put together the Project Surya, in which they're trying to replace the biomass burning stoves that are used for cooking in India, in villages in India, and replace that with clean burning stoves. And then they're trying to see if they can see that from space. And they think that this is going to be a very successful technology. What about the dust? That was taking care of the black carbon. What about the dust? Well, we've done it before in this country. The Dust Bowl brought us huge dust storms. And we realized that it was a regional problem that wasn't just the drought, it was also what we were doing with the land and that we could be smarter about how we use the land and reduce those dust storms. We don't see these kinds of dust storms in the Midwest anymore because of that action. Okay, so remember that those measurements that I showed you from the upper Colorado, those are actually unique globally. There are no other measurements that are out in the mountain ranges of the world that give you that information. So we're having to extrapolate from those measurements and then based on our knowledge of how much dust and black carbon is increasing in other parts of the world in those mountain ranges, to think we know what's happening in those areas. But it's extraordinarily difficult to put an energy balance tower at nearly 7,000 meters in the Himalaya. People die doing that, and the towers fall over, and they're very hard to maintain. So what that takes us then, takes us to is remote sensing. So my group has been squeezing the MODIS spectrum, the, the NASA Terra Moderate Resolution Imaging Spectroradiometer. Uh, for as much information as we can about dust deposition. But what we've ended up with is a very qualitative measure. The only way that we can get to a quantitative measure is with a spectrometer. And we don't currently have a high-quality spectrometer in space. We send them out to other parts of the solar system, but looking at Earth, we haven't done that yet. So it's something we desperately need. Now, about 10 years out, NASA has planned HISPRI, which is the Hyperspectral Infrared Imager, has a visible near-infrared spectrometer and a thermal infrared imager to map, the, map the, uh, the surface of the Earth at very high spectral resolution, hundreds of colors. And that will give us the most detailed look at the Earth's surface that we've yet had. This is really the Star Trek technology that we ultimately need to go to. And it's also the mature form of remote sensing. Beyond this, the spectral resolutions will change, the spatial resolutions will change, but this is the mature form. This is the asymptote. So until we get history 10 years out, and a lot of changes can happen in between then, including possibly the mitigation, we're building the Airborne Snow Observatory. The Airborne Snow, the Airborne Snow Observatory has an imaging LIDAR on board, which will give us unprecedented views of the mountain snowpack, the snow depth, and the snow water equivalent, how much water there is. And then from the spectrometer on board, 
It will give us the dust rate of deforesting, how much additional sunlight is going into the snowpack because of the dust and the snow reflectivity, so that we can actually know this in places like the, the Himalaya, the Hindu Kush, the Tian Shan, the Andes. Okay, so I want to close out with the little people. I, when I think about, as I said at the beginning, I think about the relationships and the people are who make this happen, and we stand on their shoulders. We're beginning to build the calluses on our shoulders for them, and we hope that they will bring us, if their paths take us, take them into this field, it will ultimately take us into a more open mind and an open vision that can benefit more than a billion people in a decade. Thank you.